you're listening to Fast Facts Perio Edition. And now, here's your host, Katrina Sanders. Welcome back, everyone, to Fast Facts Perio Edition. We are so excited to have Katrina Sanders continue to do our Fast Facts Perio Edition series this year. I just couldn't tell you how thrilled we are about it. And you're going to hear her voice next week. Well, you'll hear her voice this week as well. But to get us started on the right foot in 2023, I thought maybe let's share with you a couple of our favorite episodes from Katrina that you might have missed. So enjoy these two episodes. This week, we're going to take a look at the current prevalence of diseases of the periodontium. And you guys, I'm going to try to not get passionate about it, but I can't promise that I'm not going to get passionate about this because this is a topic that is extremely near and dear to my heart. So if you guys don't just mind, let's dive right in. (laughs) Beginning by talking about the national prevalence of periodontitis. Now, I think we all remember in 2016, when the ADA published uh, in tandem with the Department of Health and Human Services research about the estimation of prevalence of periodontitis across United States adults. And the Journal of Dental Research published this article stating that the estimation right now is upwards of 47.2% of U.S. adults between the ages of 30 and 79 have some form of periodontitis. I want to clarify, periodontitis is defined as the irreversible form of a disease of the periodontium. So one could theoretically say that nearly one in two U.S. adults between the ages of 30 and 79 have some form of irreversible disease in their mouth. What's more, 93.9% of the remaining patient population, the individuals who do not have attachment loss, 93.9% of those individuals have gingivitis. Now, to clarify, gingivitis is loosely termed as the reversible inflammatory condition of the periodontium. And gingivitis itself is classified as a disease of the periodontium. What's more, 55.7% of the the individuals who do not have periodontitis but do have gingivitis, 55.7% of those individuals have a gingival index over one, indicating they have moderate to severe gingivitis. Now, I don't know about you. I uh, grew up in a a very humble Midwest household where I have incredible PTSD from my dad teaching me high school math while crying at the dining room table. So (laughs) I did um, some uh, research. I called my dad. I said, Dad, I need some help here. So if 47.2% of our adult patient population happens to have perio and the remaining individuals and 93.9% of those people have gingivitis, but even more so 55.7% of those people have gingivitis, that is either a gingival index over one indicating moderate or severe gingivitis. Help me out, dad. What is the percentage of individuals who have moderate to severe gingivitis? And that number is 27.6% of our patient population. That is according to my Midwest dad, by the way. In the remaining patient population, we are looking at 25.2% of those individuals who are considered either healthy or incipient gingivitis. And to clarify even more, the population of true individuals, of individuals who are adults who do not have irreversible bone loss at this point, that percentage is 3.2%. So 3.2% of our patients are considered truly healthy patients. 22% of those individuals are considered incipient gingivitis. So those are considered the patients that are excellent candidates for a preventive therapy. 27.6% of our patients have moderate to severe gingivitis. These are individuals who do have an active disease of the periodontium, albeit reversible, but still a disease of the periodontium. And finally, 47.2% of our patients have some form of periodontitis, whether that is mild, moderate, severe, or stable on a reduced periodontium, stabilized periodontitis cases. 
Today, we are beginning the conversation in deep diving around how we now classify diseases of the periodontium associated with dental implants. Now, this is a very interesting concept because for the first time, dental implants have been located in the mouth long enough to actually develop disease around them. And so in 2017, published in 2018, the American Academy of Periodontology began to classify four major classification systems as they relate to peri-implant health or peri-implant disease. And peri-implant disease or peri-implant health are going to fit into one of four specific categories. This is where we're looking at things like peri-implant health, peri-implant mucositis, peri-implantitis, or peri-implant soft and hard tissue deficiencies. Now, to begin this conversation about peri-implant diseases, I want to be very clear. The American Academy of Periodontology has really kicked open the door on this drama, so to speak, around how we as clinicians are expected to evaluate diseases around peri-implant mucosa. You see, The vast majority of us were taught in dental and dental hygiene school to be very careful around dental implants. Many implants were regular implants. Some of us were taught to leave the dental implant alone unless the tissue began to observe otherwise. Many of us were taught to not probe a dental implant. Some of us were taught to probe a dental implant. Many of us were taught to take radiographs around a dental implant to evaluate changes in the bone. And yet many of us were taught that oftentimes a two-dimensional image of a three-dimensional object is not going to give you the most optimal display. And so uh, the data continues to unfold. Uh, The current statement from the American Academy of Periodontology states as such. When we take a look at implant studies, and I want to be very clear, these are implant studies uh, of humans as well as animals. We love beagle studies. When we take a look at a lot of these studies and we find that these dental implants are placed within an edentulous ridge, what we're really looking for is what does an optimal anatomy look like? So when we uh, take a look at optimal peri-implant mucosa, we see that on the buccal aspect that that mucosa averages about three to four millimeters high from the mucosal margin to the crest of that peri-implant bone. This is where we started to look at when our probing depths are an advanced depth around a dental implant. Is this due to the collar of tissue around a dental implant or is this truly due to peri-implant mucosal disease? See, when we take a look at how the gingiva and peri-implant mucosa seal, we know that in dental implant experience uh, that uh, there can be consistent challenges from the oral environment. And so we know that it is important for the implant surfaces to be appropriately sealed with high level attachment around the apparatus. So uh, let's look at the drama around probing peri-implant tissues. You see, for many years, it was incorrectly assumed that the tip of a periodontal probe in a probing depth would identify the uh, most apical base of that dentogingival epithelium. We've now acknowledged that uh, that may not necessarily be the case. In healthy sites, that tip of that probe uh, oftentimes fails to reach the most apical portion, while in diseased sites, we find that there is not as much resistance, and so the probe can actually find not only the apical base, but can also allow for uh, infiltration of inflammatory cells. This is where there were concerns. If dental professionals were probing a dental implant, could they theoretically break through the surrounding tissues into the underlying connective tissue? And so uh, we began to understand that while probing a dental implant is a critical aspect of identifying peri-implant disease or peri-implant health, It should be notated that when probing a dental implant, uh, clinicians should ensure that we are not jeopardizing the integrity of our soft tissue adhesion. So the statement was made that yes, uh, clinical probing uh, should be done. However, when probing a dental implant, about 50% the PSI or pressure that is typically used around a tooth structure should be applied to identify the base around a pocket affiliated with a dental implant. 
What's more, it's important for us to remember that in a healthy tooth situation, the attachment will likely follow the contour of the CEJ or the cementoenamel junction. However, we do acknowledge that in a dental implant situation, we're not looking at a CEJ or cementoenamel junction. And so oftentimes we will denote that in the interproximal space, a probing depth of a greater reading could be observed simply due to the tissue that is occupying that interdental space. Well, that's all we have today for the drama around to probe or not to probe a dental implant. Know that if you are probing dental implants, that the pressure with which you use and the evaluation of the anatomical observation or display of that gingiva is going to be a critical layer in identifying the health or disease level of the tissue. This has been another episode of Fast Facts Perio Edition with Katrina Sanders. Please feel free to reach me on Instagram at the Dental Wine Genist or on my website, www.katrinasanders.com. Cheers.